Welcome back to your Hotel Bar Sessions, episode 15. Today's topic, Hey Biden. Welcome back to Hotel Bar Sessions podcast, the podcast where three philosophers sit down together as if it were the end of a long day at a philosophy conference to shoot the breeze and talk through issues at the hotel bar afterwards. As always, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Lee Johnson. Hey, everybody. And Shannon Musset. What's up? So before we get into today's topic, I'm hoping I can find out, uh, first of all, what what are you guys drinking? And then also, what session did you just get out of? So I'm going to say that this time I'm going to do what I actually do when I go to conferences, (laughs) because in Utah, you can only get little teeny tiny drinks when you go out to bars. So every time I go to a conference outside of Utah, I order a dirty vodka martini because we only have the little teeny tiny glasses and real glasses are so much more fun to drink from. Got out of a paper called, where is everyone? Am I in the wrong room? (laughs) (laughs) What to do when it's just you and the moderator who showed up for your paper. I have, oh, I have absolutely been there. <laughs> also, There's always that moment where the moderator is like, are we going to do this? And you're like, right. do we have to do this? Do we have to do this? <laughs> do you just want to go get a drink at the bar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So I'm going to have my usual drink since it's the last episode of the season. Fireball and Diet Coke. Mm. I just got out of a session that was titled, Tell Me You're a Philosopher without telling me you're a philosopher. I'll go first. (laughs) Both because it's the last episode of of the season, not ever, but also because of the paper I just got of, I'm going to order a sparkling Prosecco because I just got out of a session called Final Rose or Last Supper, colon, Christ, Peter, Judas, and the two-on-one dates on The Bachelor. I totally don't. I totally don't get it. Of course you don't. (laughs) Trust me, it's awesome. (laughs) That was that was really pitching to Lee. I'm sorry. I think I think she caught it (laughs) or hit it. Whatever you do when you pitch. (laughs) Oh my god, that was hilarious. So what are we talking about today, Eamon? So for our last episode, I appreciate that you guys are indulging me in this. It's a little bit out of the range of some of our podcasts so far. But in addition to this being the end of our season, this is close to, we're a little bit past the first 100 days of the Biden presidency. And nothing says excitement as much as the Biden presidency. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ain't that the truth. So I was hoping we could talk through... And, you know, I don't think any of us are explicitly political philosophers, although we all do some stuff with political philosophy. But I'm hoping we could talk through what's going on in the world and politics under the title, Hey, Biden. Hey, Biden. Hey, Hey Biden. Hey, Biden. (laughs) Biden. Biden's like, new phone, who dis? (laughs) Like, new phone, who dis? (laughs) So the idea is I want to sort of talk through with you guys what we have been both impressed and unimpressed with thus far in the presidency. But even more, since we're experts in value, right, since we're philosophers and philosophers are, as we know, the center of uh, advice for wisdom, I think that we could do the whole world a service by pitching some ideas to Biden. And, you know, start off with some ideas that are maybe we hope manageable, but then let's really give him something to work with. I will say this is just me speaking for myself. I went into this presidency. I I did vote for Biden. I don't know that I have to admit or not admit that, but I did vote for him. But to be honest, I was voting against Trump. I think that of the people who had a chance of getting the Democratic nomination, Biden was my dead last, I think, even after Pete Buttigieg. No, no. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you, need to, you need to walk that one back there. All- you know, like I didn't go in with a lot of expectations, but I will say, I will be honest, and I've tried to be open about the fact that thus far I've actually been really surprised. I was really expecting a four-year caretaker presidency. And thus far, that seems to not be what we're getting. So I've been pleasantly surprised. So yeah, I'm hoping we can talk through, let's start off positive, right? Like, why not? Let's talk through some of the things that we've been pretty happy with thus far. I agree with you, Ammon. I, too, did not want Biden to be the nominee. I was completely uninspired and unexcited about it and have been, despite myself, pretty surprised at how well this beginning of his presidency has gone. So it is a weird position to be in because we tend to be harsh critics of our politicians. And yeah, so that's been somewhat surprising and in a good way. So I have sort of two things that I think I am impressed with. One is not entirely serious, but it is also kind of serious with serious, but it is also kind of serious, which is 
it's been emotionally untraumatizing. And just the fact that it's not this daily barrage of hideous policies and horrible comments and tragic undoing of social fabrics, that that alone has been really nice. I think, was it Mother Jones had that article about everybody's actually excited about the normal, boring president. The the polls show we just kind of want a little bit of boring old man. So that has been really nice, just the lack of constant trauma. But that's not really anything positive, although it's obviously a strategy he's using. I mean, he's trying to be the calming, placating, everything's going to be okay voice after four years of the exact opposite of that. And then, honestly, I think one of the things that has been truly the most impressive, which we've all benefited from, at the head of this, Uh after what Trump did with all the deliberate fumbling of those balls, I just thought, oh God, there's no way we're going to be in absolute despair for another year. And here we are, all of us vaccinated, our younger kids, you know, 12 to 13 year olds are about to be able to be vaccinated. And this is completely because he put the money and the time and the effort into making that happen. That's been amazing. And I really have very few criticisms about his response to that. I want to echo Shannon's comments there. One of the things that I remember a few episodes ago, Ammon describing Biden's run for the presidency as basically running on this slogan, don't you all want to just go back to brunch? (laughs) Yeah, right. And and I got to say, brunch is nice. Yeah. (laughs) I'm enjoying brunch. (laughs) Like So yes, exactly what Shannon said. This idea that we're not just in this circus every day, And it just being sort of one, you know, I'm trying. Yeah, trauma is a good trauma is a good way to say it. But just one thing after another that you can't even wrap your head around. You can't even keep up with that constant feeling of waiting for the other shoe to drop as the other shoe is the other shoe is dropping all the time. So that has been really nice. I also want to say I think that he's just killed it with. COVID. I mean, he's just done an amazing job. And part of that, I do think, has been the messaging. And I think that there are a lot of things to critique about Biden's messaging. But two things not to critique are that he is 100% clear about what he's for, what he's against, what he's going to do, and what he's not going to do. And later, when we talk about our criticisms of him, I want to talk about some critiques of what he's not going to do. But also, he's got the greatest White House press secretary ever. Jen Psaki (laughs) is an absolute queen. Like, she is amazing. And so, if the greatest White House press secretary ever, Jen Psaki (laughs) is an absolute queen. Like, she is amazing. And so, if you're not sort of down with the granddaddy Joe, or, you know, I mean, he's not Uncle Joe anymore, but granddaddy (laughs) Joe then listen to Jen Psaki because she is a force of nature. I think you guys have hit on the big ones. I think we have a lot to talk about with respect to COVID and and where that's gone. One of my first suggestions that I was going to make earlier, and I'm stunned that I was preempted here. One of the places where I had been a little critical with Biden with respect to COVID is part of the reason why we've been able to vaccinate ourselves so quickly is because a lot of vaccines are made in the U.S. and we've kept a lot of them here, which a lot of countries have done. However... I'm putting this in the I'm impressed category. One of the things I was going to suggest later on in the show today was that we need to eliminate vaccine copyrights or yes. we need to release as many of the fucking yes. vaccines as possible. And I was stunned when the Biden administration said that they were going to recommend that to the WHO. It's far from a done deal, but that's huge. And I think it speaks in general to this idea that they really appreciate the gravity of the pandemic not only does it save lives, but it fosters international relationships based on goodwill, right? It's no longer the Trump universe of America first and everybody else can just die. It's look at we're in this together. And if we can share this with the rest of the world, that's going to gain back, I think, a lot of what we lost in the last four years. Which is no small task, really, because Trump obviously left our international relations with almost every country that we want to be friends with in a state that was basically a stinking pile of shit. Yeah. (laughs) On the other hand, middle finger. On the other hand, we're doing great with all the countries that we don't want to be friends with. So there was that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
a lot. So the other one is, and I, I'm again, I'm stunned on this. So I supported Bernie in the primary, which is probably not a shock to anyone. I regard Bernie and folks like AOC as about as far left as you can get in American politics and get away with it, which means that I think of them as centrists. But economically, the kinds of policies that they were advocating, I really was worried coming into this year were dead. And I have been stunned. While things have not moved as fast as I would have wanted, I've been really impressed with, and and we don't know what's going to happen with them yet, but I've been really impressed with the really ambitious programs that have so far been proposed not only the relief package that already passed, but the jobs bill that's coming out, the mm-hmm. the bills targeting infrastructure and education. I've been thinking so much about these because on the one hand, these are the biggest pieces of legislation in my life, probably. And they're nowhere near adequate to the problem. Yeah. After 40, you know, I'm 42. And after 42 years of austerity, seeing a president propose bills, not austerity, and seeing one of the architects of austerity proposing bills, not just on the basis of austerity, has really changed my perspective in a lot of ways. And can I also just say, I mean, I'm so impressed with the diversity of the cabinet. He really went out of his way to be like representation matters. And so in order to bring in all of these big projects, in order to get these accepted and carried forward by people, he's got this really diverse cabinet to to say, look, this is about everybody in everybody's best interest. I totally agree that he has put diversity issues forward. And I actually just want to share a short clip from the address that he made to the joint session of Congress in late April. We have a giant opportunity to bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice, real justice. And with the plans outlined tonight, we have a real chance to systemic racism that plagues America and American lives in other ways. A chance to deliver real equity. Good jobs, good schools, affordable housing, clean air, clean water, being able to generate wealth and pass it down to generations because you have an access to purchase a house. Real opportunities in the lives of more Americans, black, white, Latino, Asian Americans, Native Americans. Look, I also want to thank the United States Senate for voting 94 to 1 to pass the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to protect Asian American and Pacific Islanders. You acted decisively. You can see on television the viciousness of the hate crimes we've seen over the past year, this past year and for too long. I urge the House to do the same and send that legislation to my desk, which I will gladly, anxiously sign. I also hope Congress will get to my desk the Equality Act to protect LGBTQ Americans. For all transgender Americans watching at home, especially young people, you're so brave. I want you to know your president has your back. The president of the United States said to all transgender Americans, especially the young ones, I want you to know that the president has your back. I mean, that's not legislation. I get it. That's not changing cultural norms and biases. I get it. But that, to me, is huge. It is. I I completely agree. One of the questions that I hope we can talk some about today is what reasonably we expect the the purpose of sort of pitching things to the president to be. I, I think that symbolism matters. And even if this isn't an actual legislation, to, to say I have your back and to express that kind of solidarity is something that I have your back and to express that kind of solidarity is something that I'm really impressed with. And that really matters, I think. You know, it, I know it matters to my kids, matters to me. This is a little bit of a callback to our episode on shame. But one of the things that we talked about in the episode on shame was how during the Trump years that it just became acceptable to act in a shameless manner in public. Right. And one of the things that was so damaging about that administration was that it left this legacy of bringing out of the dark corners of the world all of the racists and sexists and homophobes and transphobes and saying, yes, you should say what you think out loud. And I think that what Biden has done really well is from day one say, you should be ashamed of being this way. You should be ashamed of thinking these things. This is not who we are. It's not this. Many people disagree and I can see both sides. Your message that it is 
shameful to be racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic. I would have loved to have seen him call out the, the 94 to 1. I would have loved to see him call out the 1. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to guess it was Rand Paul, but I don't know. And also, by the way, the 5 who apparently abstained, right? But I bet if you gave him a sparkling Prosecco, he would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> So a political scientist who I like a good deal, Corey Robin, he's been arguing even at the start of the Trump presidency, he was arguing that in a lot of ways, Trump was much weaker than we made him out to be. And that in general, he was arguing that the neoliberal moment, which Trump doesn't really fit into in a lot of ways, but this moment of politics, which again has been pretty much all of our lives, where American politics has been dominated by a rightward retrenchment coupled on politics has been dominated by a rightward retrenchment coupled on the left by liberals embracing austerity was actually sort of that Trump was a sign of its weakness. And one of the things that he would point to a lot of times is the extent to which Trump had to rely on executive actions to push a pretty hateful agenda. I think that Biden, along with not just sort of, again, rhetorically and symbolically expressing this shame, I think he has, we've seen that one nice thing about that is it means that a lot of this has been able to be undone very quickly. So a lot of the codified discrimination that Trump, so Trump removed transgender protections for folks in the army, for example, Biden reinstated them. Those are real changes that we are already seeing the effects of. I want to be down with that. But Biden has done, I think, maybe over 60 executive actions. I think he's done more than any president in the first hundred days. So it's not like he's not relying on executive actions. And he's in this relief that Trump did, which means, is this now the game? Is the game now then the next president comes in and does executive actions to undo what Biden did or whatever? I, I don't know that it's true or that I buy the idea that Trump was weak because he used executive actions. I'm actually afraid it's a sign that that's the direction that politics in this country is moving. And it's really important also to remember that in the meantime, the other lingering effect of the last 30 neoliberal years is that all of this stuff has gotten pushed back to the states. So while Biden stands in front of the joint sessions of Congress and says to all transgender Americans, I want you to know that the president has your back right here in Tennessee, and I'm sure also in Ohio and Utah, we are passing legislation that is anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ. It failed in Utah. We had like a tiny, tiny, tiny one, tiny victory. You know, take the tiny wins, right? But, yeah, no, but right. Lee, I completely agree. And I think that, but, no, yeah, but Lee, right. I completely agree. And I think that, yeah, I mean, we're focusing on the positive things in part because where we're going to go, it's a lot of here is like the reasons to be really skeptical about long-term structural changes in America, which remain real. You know, I think that the executive actions predates even Trump. It's been on the rise again throughout these neoliberal mm. years. And it's unclear, I think it's an open question whether or not the American legislative system works anymore, right, is capable of working, or is it just a bunch of stopgap measures? On the other hand, I do think one real sea change, and it's in a lot of ways rhetorical or symbolic, is that even more than under Obama and certainly more than under Clinton, these executive actions have been pitched from the perspective of a genuine view of, again, what I called earlier solidarity. I mean... I know Biden wouldn't use the word comradeship, but I think there's been this sense that these are pitched at re-empowering the working class, re-empowering folks who are not in power. And again, coming from a 40-year politician, that was a real surprise to me. The Amazon unionization in Alabama, yeah. wasn't he pro that? That, yeah. that, that, that was big. And he me. was also, I mean, the, the, one of the things that I'm going to push, which Biden has endorsed, is the PRO Act, which would greatly strengthen the power of unions and collective bargaining right. and substantially make all of our lives better pretty much immediately. I also want to congratulate Biden, and he hasn't done this often, and he probably hasn't done this as loudly as I would like, but he has pretty consistently owned up to his past wrongs. He said, I was an architect in some of this legislation that has created the problems that we have now. Let me help to undo them which is a dramatic change from our previous president, who, of course, said, no, I never ask God for forgiveness because me and God have a great relationship and the evangelicals love me. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> Ouch. I feel like Biden is at the end of his life and he's like, right, and let's you hope. Know. Been watching his Dorian Gray picture. He's like, oh man, it's. <laughs> <laughs> It's that mold? It's actually, yeah. That's actually just this mirror. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's enough of a love fest then, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's more than we can handle. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Let me switch my settings to bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listeners, we really do love to hear from you. So feel free to send us an audio clip with a comment or a question to hotelbarpodcast at gmail.com. Also check out the interactive page on our website, hotelbarpodcast.com, where we often post questions or solicit comments about future topic episodes. You may hear yourself on a future episode. So what are some of the things that you guys have been more disappointed with? I don't know what we're going to do in the coming years as the sort of crisis of the environment is going to, to bring more and more immigrants and migrations across the world. But there is definitely not a solution happening at the Mexican border. And there is a real serious crisis. And it, it's great that he's trying to reunite you know, children with parents, that's obviously like the bare minimum we can do as human beings, but this is huge and a lot more energy and effort needs to be put into an international solution or at least a game plan for how to handle this. And I have not been impressed. If I had to describe it broadly, my biggest disappointment in the Biden presidency has been that he did not capitalize on the presidency has been that he did not capitalize on the more left wing of the Democratic Party's mm -hmm. enthusiasm, ideas, actual yeah. policy recommendations, et cetera. And in particular, he has completely shit the bed on student loans. Like, yeah, I he not, totally I, did. I do not know why this man cannot get on board with something that has like 80% approval rate in his own party and a greater than 50% approval rate in the nation. And could probably and be accomplished by executive action. Absolutely could be accomplished by executive action. And moreover, would pave the way for really dramatic and nation changing shifts of the sort that, for example, Bernie Sanders and Representative Jayapal are suggesting with their New Deal for education. I've never been able to understand other than vacuous moral reasons. I have never been able to understand the arguments against canceling student debt. <laughs> I think that the vacuous moral reasons apparently have a really strong truck Right. I mean, well, and, they, and it's, it's, the, it's, it's the hazing thing. I got hazed. So yeah. why do you not have to get hazed? It's just this kind of this is the way though. it's always been. Why if I had to pay it back, why shouldn't you have to pay it back? Attitude. I, I totally agree with that. It's the most OK boomer argument. Oh, ever. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even though they didn't have nearly the kind of debt. No, it's they also, it's also it's, you know, I think it's so limiting because there are ways of thinking of student debt that go far beyond college education. I mean, that can be extended to all kinds of debt that people take on in job training. Can I say so it is a very much an OK Boomer moment that said, I have been really disappointed, even with a lot of folks in our generation on this. I think a lot of Gen Xers have really embraced with a lot of folks in our generation on this. I think a lot of Gen Xers have really embraced their inner boomer. I I don't want to start some sort of like I don't and I think generational politics a lot of times ends up being not that interesting, but I have been really disappointed with so many people who are my age and not that much older who lived through these things and cannot seem to have basic compassion. Which is not to get Biden off the hook because he should be showing leadership on this. But I agree with you, not about the claim that generational politics is not useful, because I think it actually quite often is. But I agree with you that Gen Xers are becoming very boomer-esque in this moment. And it makes total sense that we would, right? I mean, the vast majority of us are living in conditions of precarity, in a depression, literally yeah. in a depression. And I think that the things that you see 
in the millennial and Zoomer generations, the sort of characterization of the parody in a depression, literally yeah. in a depression. And I think that the things that you see in the millennial and Zoomer generations, the sort of characterization of them is that they're a lot more fiscally conservative, right? And of mm -hmm. course that is the case. That is the case when people don't have the means to survive. That is of course the case. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't surprise me at all. Neither the Biden administration nor the Obama administration were effective in communicating the large social changes that could be affected by these sorts of changes. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. The things that you guys are pointing to are things that I've been really disappointed with. And on the border, look, I understand that it's hard to know exactly what's going on on the border. I understand that it's hard to just shift policies overnight. But we were promised and we were promised a reversal on day one with respect to certain things at the border. And it didn't happen. I mean, mm -hmm. it was only under pressure that Biden even started to lift the numbers of refugees that are being allowed in. That's right. Well, no, you don't, actually. Like, if you stop having a carceral approach to the border and if you allow children who are coming across unaccompanied to be immediately integrated into our network of social services, that's better than this weird supposed holding pattern that we already know extends too long beyond the time that it becomes an international war crime, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, the yeah. the and that shit should have stopped on day one. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to shift the conversation, but I was also going to say an issue that he did not get behind that he should have was the increase in the minimum wage and how necessary and how late are we already in not doing something about that? And then just to sort of be like, well, it was a good idea, but now I'm not going to support it when it should actually just be mandated and there should be no discussion about it because $15 an hour isn't even enough. No. That's not even close to enough for people to actually have a, a living uh, wage. So that was a huge disappointment. Yeah. And he hasn't really been very good at whipping votes. I mean, I think that one of the things votes I mean, I think that one of the things that the Biden people sold the Democratic Party on Biden with was that this is a lifelong legislator. He knows these people. He knows the people across the aisle. He's going to be able to get in there and bridge these divides and whip these votes. And he just hasn't done it. And I'm not sure that that's entirely can be blamed on him. But I do think that there is a lot that can be blamed on him in that regard. Yeah, it's like he's somehow beholden to Joe Manchin. It's like this guy has just got everybody under his thumb. And it's like, no, you should be able to talk to that feller and get some <laughs> things done here, Joe. And actually on that exact point, I think another real failure of Joe Biden has been to be so reserved about talking about what's happening to the Republican Party. And I get it. I get it that he's like, we're get it that he's like, we're going to do COVID and pretty much that's it, right? We're not going to talk about the previous president. We're not going to talk about QAnon. We're not going to talk about any other kind of nonsense that's going on uh, in this sort of- Malarkey. <laughs> we're not going to talk about malarkey. But the problem with that is that it has made it impossible for him to whip the votes. Look what just happened with Liz Cheney. So this silence about what's going on and the problems with the Republican Party. At the beginning, I said it's been so nice not having to hear about Trump's constant destruction of the social fabric. But on the other hand, the Republican Party is still chugging along in the same kind of cesspool septic tank mentality that gave rise to Trump. And whether you like Cheney or not is not really the issue. She at least maintained that the election wasn't stolen and that there was an insurrection that Trump had everything to do with. And the fact that maintaining that being that position gets her ousted from her power in the party is frightening. And it's because the Republicans are going for 2022. And as much as I like the idea of, OK, we're not going to feed the Trump dumpster fire anymore, it's also continuing to breed the exact same problems that gave rise to him in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I think that 2022 and 2024 are huge huge concerns. We're in and, danger. And, and I don't think that we're taking them seriously enough. But I think that, you know, to, to you guys' point about the vote whipping, like one thing that just frustrates me to no end is that whenever the Republicans are in power, we're always told about, well, Collins and Murkowski, they have to sell out to their rightward base all the time because they're Republicans. What else are they going to do? But the second the Democrats get power, suddenly Joe Manchin, 
Yes. Who, and I'm, I'm going to lose our last Mansion supporters on this podcast. That's is fine. Maybe the most disgusting person in America. Awful. As far as I'm concerned right I'm now. I'm so mad at him. And Chris and Cinema, who I used to like because she liked Chris and Cinema. Who I used to like because she liked me as an ex Mormon who went to BYU, but <laughs> she's dead to me now, right? That sort of that sort of identification only goes so far. The, the fact that we're like, oh well, you know, we have to cater to these two objectively awful people repeatedly, and that we all accept that, and Biden just sort of throws up his hands and says, well, I got to deal with that. Right. That really bodes ill for the future. I mean, yeah. I really do feel like, and this is my concern that. We're really just getting a breather. And yeah. if everything shifts dramatically, even a little bit in 2022, we are right back in this like dead stalemate contestation of power that goes nowhere until 2024 when things could get really bad. Yeah. And let's not forget that we lost completely the judicial branch yes. in the last election. And we're not getting that back for 75 years. So we got to use the time that we have. Didn't Biden put together a commission to look into to look into yeah. reform for the Supreme Court? I mean, that's not a completely dead topic, is it? I think that people are talking about expanding the Supreme Court, but I feel like people are talking about that with the urgency that they're talking about abolishing the filibuster, which right. is none. D.C. Yeah. statehood. Even though that these are actually incredibly necessary to the health of our democracy. So the other area that I will say that I've been incredibly disappointed with Biden in, and this one is not a surprise, but it's going to be in the long run as devastating as everything else, is complete maintenance of the status quo with respect to international relationships. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's true that we're playing good cop again instead of bad cop. We're being nice. But we still seem to have not shifted our attitudes with respect to our involvement in Latin America, Israel, which I want to talk about a lot more in a little bit. And in general, Biden's policies towards the Middle East remain far too bellicose. That Trump and Biden are outdoing one another with respect to trying to gin up a conflict with China is in the long I mean, Maybe we'll talk more about Israel in a bit. But just to preface, we're recording this in the second week of May right after there's been huge Israeli attacks on Palestinian protesters in Jerusalem, especially around Al-Aqsa Mosque and some of the neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. And the failure of leadership that America has been guilty of here is, as we know, is now multi-generational and is, in my view, completely disqualifying of us as moral authorities. We are entirely complicit, and there's no sign that Biden is going to do anything exercise any of the power the United States has. And it's shameful. And, you know, I, I think that while there are some things we can hope with respect to foreign policy, the failures that we've already seen are profound. That's enough of a straightforward hate fest. We've already got a lot to talk about. That's enough of a straightforward hate fest. We've already got a lot to talk about. It was more like a dislike fest. I wouldn't call dislike it a hate fest. fest. Yeah. <laughs> Disappointed well, fest. I don't know. I, I'm pretty salty about the student loans. <laughs> yeah, no, me too. So we're only in 100 days. And we've pointed to some of the challenges here. Now let's get to the section that we call, hey, Biden. Hey, Biden. Hey, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna Biden. Keep from now. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've got Joe's attention, if we got uh, Jen Psaki to appear on our podcast, which I, I her people have reached out to us about, and she sits down with us and we pitch her some ideas to send back to Grandpa Joe. What are the things you guys are sending back? What are the proposals that you would like to see happening in the next year, in the next two years, in the next four years? I'm glad he canceled the Keystone Pipeline and that he halted new oil and gas leases on federal land. If I could just have my more modest request that I don't think is pie in the sky. And perhaps it's somewhat self-interested because it's in Utah. And perhaps it's somewhat self-interested because it's in Utah, but I want Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante back. I want everything that Trump took away from those lands and as monuments to, you know, he took 85% away from Bears Ears and I think like 50% away from Grand Staircase. And I want that back because there's already all this evidence of people just destroying these lands with their ATVs and treasure hunters going out there and taking relics and pottery. And it's just, it's a travesty. And of course there's the uranium mining and these are ancestral lands. And there were five different tribes that came together. I mean, you had the Navajo, you had the Hopi, you had the Utes, and they came together 
even though they disagreed on so many things about preserving this land. And so if I could have that and I could have his ear, and I think with Deb Haaland in as the interior secretary, it's a real possibility. There's no coming back. It never comes back. It's just gone. Yeah, I grew up in Utah, and I miss the Southwest every day still. It's majestic and spiritual and sacred to specific historical people who have Mm -hmm. a claim to the land that can go away. That's urgent in a way that's really hard to explain. I completely agree. What about you, Lee? I agree with you. I'd like to see him get behind the Green New Deal. I'd also like to see him get behind the Education New Deal. But if I were going to think about new things to recommend to Biden, I have a few things, a nice bouquet of things that I would like to present to him and uh, Psaki. So the first thing is, I think we need a New Deal type infrastructure plan. As a matter of fact, just yesterday in Memphis, there is a, so Memphis sits in the Southwest corner of Tennessee and is connected to Arkansas by a huge bridge. It's called the Hernando de Soto Bridge that yesterday the bridge. Now this is a major three-way. And everybody else who thinks like, I don't care about the bridge between Memphis and West Memphis. Let me remind you that FedEx is in Memphis. So this affects everyone. The second thing, which will come as no surprise to either of you, I wish that he would create a cabinet level position for a secretary of technology. Yeah. And I wish that we had a national plan that addressed automation, AI and machine learning and what we might broadly call tech ethics in the justice system and education, and in most importantly, probably credit scoring and banking. Here, here. Those are huge things. The third thing that I would recommend, this is my final thing, but the third thing that I would recommend is a little more philosophical. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, which is that I don't think that Biden has been proactive enough about his messaging in a way to undo the harms done by the Trump administration, which is that I don't think that Biden has been proactive enough about his messaging in a way to undo the harms done by the Trump administration. One thing that I would like to see him do is to initiate a kind of national conversation about free speech and to reframe the conversation, not as who has a right to speak or everyone has a right to speak or what kinds of speech is acceptable in the public sphere, what kinds of speech isn't acceptable in the public sphere. But to say, you know what, we need to completely rethink how we think about freedom of speech. It's not about primarily the rights of the speaker. It's about the rights of the listener. And people have a right to be told the truth. And people have a right to be able to distinguish between true information and false information. And so this idea that we're just trying to block or temporarily suspend the Twitter public sphere of speech is a a legacy, not just of the Trump administration, but of the last 250 years of the way that we've talked about free speech. But I'd really like to see him get on top of this and say, this is a country that is committed to the truth more than your right to say whatever the F you want. Dr. So, Lee Johnson for president 2024. No, yeah, so thank you. Before if, get, if nominated, we'll actually, I will not run. And if elected, I will not serve. <laughs> so, but can I ask you, who would you put if, who would you put in that uh, secretary of technology position? Obviously, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind. I'm no longer on board. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. (laughs) I think my first suggestion for Secretary of Technology would be probably to Nick Gabriel. But if we could have co-secretaries, the other person would be Kathy O'Neill. And then you would be the undersecretary? No, just kidding. No, I think those are both (laughs) great choices. I will not serve. (laughs) No, I will serve as undersecretary. Only so I can brunch with those two. I think those are great choices. With respect to your third point, dealing with this question of, you know, what exactly is the problem with political discourse in America and sort of proposing, and you know, he's not alone in proposing this, but I think he, he does a good analysis of it that we'll put in our links, two competing explanations, one being that the problem is polarization, in which case more friendly speech is the right answer. The other being misinformation and propaganda, in which case the kinds of things that you're describing become incredibly important. Gwen falls on the side ultimately of propaganda. That's where I fall also 
Same. Meaning the point is we have to limit propaganda? Well, meaning the point is that the, the main reason why our political discourse is so unable to reach consensus isn't because, oh, people are just in their bubbles and not talking to each other, but because there is so much bad information that's allowed to circulate that it becomes impossible to distinguish between good and bad information. Right. So then Lee's point is that, that we actually have to take that seriously and stop it and not just be like, let more flowers and yeah. pestilent money. That it becomes impossible to distinguish between good and bad information. Right. So then Lee's point is that, that we actually have to take that seriously and stop it and not just be like, let more flowers and yeah. pestilent mushrooms bloom. But I do want to, if I could just interject and say that I don't think that, and again, I think this is a messaging problem. I don't think that the answer to that is to fall right back into the free speech censorship hole right, where we're just talking about the extent of the liberties of the speaker. And I think that that is just not what we need to talk about. What we need to be talking about is the harm done to everyone yeah. by false information. Yeah, and we don't have a truth infrastructure. Right. Yeah. And I think that's that that's a, a that's a bigger question. And that gets to so many other things that you guys have been touching on. Like, I do think that our ability to communicate, evaluate information, make collective decisions is an incredibly important part of our infrastructure. I, I will say that sort of in terms of my modest proposals, and let's say these are our non, -re I, I don't know any business lingo, but these would be our, you guys have already touched on a lot of the ones that I'd bring up, but one that I think is worthwhile focusing on with respect to this is concretely addressing rather than just hoping that mealy mouth language about bipartisanship will deal with the, the ways in which our political social space has been actively destroyed and is yeah. in incredibly, I think, in incredibly grave danger. Yeah. And I think that there are things that the Biden administration could do immediately to deal with that. Some of them, you know, again, depending on how you diagnose the problem, might seem counterintuitive. I think that we need to stop all this shit with bipartisanship right away. I think that bipartisanship is the wrong solution to the a misdiagnosis of the problem. Especially when one of the parties is explicitly anti-democratic. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. and agreed, but then you're right back to like, what do you do? We can't, the, the courts aren't going to solve it. So we're back to executive action. Yeah. I mean, we're in a really tight bind. I think that the only answer, I mean, there has to be a mass movement. And one of the things that the president can do, and Biden is not equipped to do that can change. And I hope you can prove me wrong, but the president has to be using the bully pulpit very effectively. You know who would have been good at that? <laughs> I, oh, Bernie, you know, yeah. I, I don't know that there's any politician other than Bernie. One thing that I think Bernie got more than anyone else of the people running was that politics is about building a movement outside of the political elite. And I don't know that he was always effective at that. I think he was far more effective than any other politician of his generation. But yeah, like I think that that's the kind of thing that's needed. I think that there are concrete things that Biden could do right away to deal with that. So a big one is the courts, right? Like, Call it whatever you want. The courts need to be fundamentally restructured yeah. or nothing else will happen. The Senate needs to be politically incapacitated as much. There shouldn't be a Senate, but unfortunately, we can't get rid of the Senate without changing the Constitution. But given that fact, the, the power of the Senate has to be reduced as greatly as possible, timing real change. Mm -hmm. And I do think there are concrete things that can be done, right? Biden and Harris should be working with Schumer right now to change the rules so that simple majorities can govern in the Senate. And all these bullshit parliamentary mechanisms, which we laud because of like the two times that they actually achieved good ends, but are fundamentally reactionary, need to be addressed. Along with that, of course, the other ticking time bomb here is, is redistricting that's coming, mm -hmm. state assault on voting rights. These things are such fundamental threats to our democracy. And I think that Biden's instincts a lot of times are to try to find some sort of compromise. This is a place where he has to be incredibly aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. There agreed. has to be no compromise with respect to voting rights, with respect to reducing the power of states to gerrymander away the right, pick their own legislators, et cetera. And along with that, there needs to be, I mean, this one I go back and forth on, the Justice Department needs to have a real reckoning with the illegality of the Trump presidency. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it festers. And in 2022 yeah. and 2024, it's coming back. That's right. Hey, everyone. We love to hear from you in the comments on our Hotel Bar Sessions Facebook page. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow the Hotel Bar Sessions podcast at Hotel Bar Podcast. You can also follow the HBS hosts on Twitter. I'm at Lovely Blueness. 
Ammon is at IdeasManPhD, and Lee is at Dr. Lee M. Johnson. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. When we started to put together this episode, we asked one of all three of our best friends and colleagues, Adriel Trot, to weigh in on this topic. And I'm hoping we can play her answer now. I've been reading this book by my colleagues, Adriel Trot, to weigh in on this topic. And I'm hoping we can play her answer now. I've been reading this book by Mary Gabriel called Love and Capital. It's the story of Carl and Jenny Marks and their relationship, but also a biography of both their lives. And one thing that I've been struck by is how in the moments that seem revolutionary, when other people are calling for radical revolutionary moves, Marx is looking at what's happening and calculating what's possible and trying to achieve the things that are possible. And he's particularly concerned that pursuing a radical revolution before the time might set things back. So Marx is sometimes given a hard time for his philosophy of history, but I think he's responsive to the moment. He's thoughtful about what the moment requires and that can, it also means thinking about what the historical moment involves. Eventually, he abandons his alignment with liberals because he finds that their concerns are constraining what's possible. And when it comes to supporting workers, that they end up wanting to serve their own political and economic interests. And so I think that that's also worth our thinking about when we ask questions like, what should Biden do? So when I think about what Biden should do, my list is between thinking about what's radical and changing that to not seem so radical anymore, but to become more obvious. And at the same time, having a big picture utopia notion of what we could and should want long term. So my list includes, I think that Biden should cancel rent. I think that Biden should cancel student loans. I think that Biden should cut financial and military support to military support to Israel as long as they function as a settler colonial state. I think that Biden should make the FDA make medical abortions, the abortion pill readily available. And I also would like to see Biden end the Monroe Doctrine. I think we should stop treating uh, Central and South America as our backyard playground for the U.S. to intervene in in order to support American capitalist interests. I think the, the time has come and that has always been a problem and I'd like to see that end. So that's my short list. Amen to all of that, though. I think that's a great list. And it really speaks to one of my hopes when I wanted the three of us and even better, it would have been the four of us to talk about all of this is like, I think that when we talk about politics, we're asking these questions of how do you move what the possible is? And I think that Adriel's answer here is really trying to speak to that, right? I hate terms like ideal politics in the sense because I don't think of myself as an idealist. I'm aware that, right? I hate terms like ideal politics in the sense because I don't think of myself as an idealist. I'm aware that you have to deal with institutions that you have. One of the fundamental questions to me is how do you move those institutions intelligently to a more just and equitable place? And I think that these proposals are exactly ways that hopefully we would do that. So are we going to join in on the what we would really want to do like Adriel did, which, by the way, those were all fabulous responses. Those were great answers. And I mean, maybe it is ideal politics, but also if we've got his ear, if Biden's listening to the podcast, <laughs> shouldn't we he really is. tell him what we really want him to do, regardless of the difficulties? Yeah, let's talk big picture. Let's talk about things that we think really need to be done. Can I just nitpick one quick thing about the ideal politics, which is that the difference between ideal politics and non-ideal politics is that ideal politics or ideal theory is theory as it would as it would operate in a non-ideal world. You can be an idealist and have a non-ideal <laughs> politics. You're, you're totally right. I was using those terms fast and loose there. I apologize for that. I partially was doing it for that reason, though, because I think that this issue of sensitivity to institution is so crucial. You know, I mean, with Marx, that was what he claimed distinguished his critical philosophy from utopian versions of socialism. But it wasn't this commitment to radical change. Yeah, but actually what I really liked about Adriel's comments is that Adriel is 
articulating very idealistic changes in non-ideal conditions. So she doesn't say, I want Joe Biden to come out and say the United States is a pro-abortion nation. (laughs) What she says is, I want Joe Biden to legalize medical abortion, the Mm -hmm. morning after pill. And she doesn't say, I want Joe Biden to come out and say the United States condemns Israeli settler colonialism. What she says is, I want Joe Biden to stop funding the Israeli state in its settler colonial activities. And also like prop activities. And also like props, Adriel, bringing out the Monroe Doctrine. <laughs> like, like I know that was some high school history respect. right there. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I do think that, and this is what she's really good at doing, is really articulating how do we operate strategically, concretely under non-ideal conditions, but still aiming at the ideal conditions that we want. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So if I could have what I wanted, which I think are going to be two very difficult things to do, one would be reparations. I'm so tired of the idea that, well, how are we going to figure reparations out and who's going to get them? And it's like, I'm done. I'm over that conversation. Just make it happen. Put together the people to do it. Give an executive order and make it happen. And I'm just tired of the desire to just prohibit any progress on that. And then the other thing is that I think that there needs to be so much more done on anything resembling a Green New Deal. I think of everything else, everything needs to be put towards climate change because none of the other policies, the Monroe Doctrine, reparations, abortion rights, none of that's going to matter if we're all dead because the planet has turned into a cinder. And I'm just very frustrated by the sort of minimal approaches that are only tinkering rather than a complete global overhaul. And yes, will we still have to deal with other countries like China and India and Japan producing problematic components to global climate change? Yes, but we're still the number two producer. We produce 15% of these toxic emissions. So if we change and we change immediately without any hesitation and without any looking back, that could cause a global shift. And without that, none of the rest of this is going to matter. We are still number one when you count what we outsource. Right. And right. So, yeah. and we, per, per capita, we're the worst. Yeah. and I, But also like, you know, American companies are the ones who are polluting across the My <laughs> ideas. I will refer you to the bouquet of ideas that I offered you <laughs> in the previous segment. But since I have another chance, I do have to say one other big change that I would like to see instituted is I would like the age limit for being elected to Congress lowered and a upper age limit established. Interesting. I don't think that you should be able to be elected to Congress after age 70 or the presidency. Wow, I'm totally down with the first part. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm down with the second part either, but I like the first part. I didn't ask y'all. This is my big idea. That's fair. Uh, You're right. Hey, 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 Biden, Biden. (laughs) Are are you over 70, Biden? (laughs) Yeah, he's going to be totally down with that. You guys, I mean, honestly, you guys and Adriel have covered most of mine. I do want us to talk a tiny bit about, uh, Shannon, you mentioned, and I know you didn't mean it exactly like this, like the, the Monroe Doctrine, et cetera, won't matter if we don't deal with the climate, which I agree with. But I think that it's worth remembering and pointing out that rather than being alternative, covered most of mine. I do want us to talk a tiny bit about, uh, Shannon, you mentioned, and I know you didn't mean it exactly like this, like the, the Monroe Doctrine, et cetera, won't matter if we don't deal with the climate, which I agree with. But I think that it's worth remembering and pointing out that rather than being alternatives, a lot of these things go in tandem. My centerpiece for this whole episode was let's start with vaccines <laughs> and let's realize that once we've uh, made COVID vaccines not restricted, well, why not insulin? Why not AIDS medicine? And I, and I still stand by that. In other words, I think that we need to fundamentally rethink health both on a national and a global level, because they're intertwined entirely. Again, that's not opposing, but it's complementary to a Green New Deal. We need to be working less. We need to be working in more green ways. And although it's pie in the sky to imagine us accomplishing these, there are political solutions to these problems that are only political. One thing that I want to say, and this will be my last comment on this, to, to think about our relationships internationally, one of the things that I find so troubling about what's going on in Israel right now And what it speaks to my concerns about international politics, I think that when we talk about climate change, if we don't solve that problem, as Shannon was pointing out, nothing else matters because we don't have an earth that supports humans in the same way anymore. One of the things that's so horrifying to me about what's taking place in Israel and Palestine right now, and that the U.S. is absolutely enabling in concrete ways that need to stop, is that we are in the process of destroying a world. 
And the horrifying thing about destroying a world is you can do that and the world moves on. Yeah. The, the Palestinians could be completely displaced from Israel. And I think what's happened is that the UAE and Saudi Arabia and other Arab nations have kind of decided that in the name of profit, they're no longer going to fight in the same way. And that's led rightly to a sense of desperation for many Palestinians because the world will move on. But that world won't move on. And the earth can sustain a lot of worlds. And if we don't stop those things right now, this is where, back to Marx, this is where we're in a profound loss. And Biden has the ability to change that. Yeah. And I wish yeah. that he would. Okay, you guys, scale of one to 10, what grade? Or actually, let's do grades. Scale so one, one to ten, what we'll great. <laughs> so on a scale of <laughs> on like a scale that. of one on a scale of one to ten, what appetizer would you order with Biden? <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Let's give Biden a grade on his first, I guess, 120 days now. B plus. B plus? B plus. All right. Ammon? Well, I'm already on the record and not believing in grades. But Same. Same. So, <laughs> a minus for effort, B overall. So like a B plus? Yeah, a B plus. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to not give him a grade, but I'm going to give him... Plus. <laughs> So I am going to not give him a grade, but I'm going to give him a sticker. A sticker? <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be a smiley face sticker that says good effort. No, I, no, I want a, I want a grade. No. Oh. You have to give a grade. <laughs> you got to give a grade. I give him a C plus. Fair. Okay. So you guys, it looks like for the last time this Aww. season, so, that is, so for the 15th time, our bartender who we never gave a name. What's our bartender's name? I guess we'll have to figure that out in season two. Our bartender. All right, viewers, call in with your favorite bartender name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, this poor dude, we need to give him a name so we can refer to him by name. He knows our drinks. We ought to know his name. But yeah, we've gotten the last call again. This has been a great season. I really am so excited to have you two as co-hosts. And I want to thank you both for being Really great all season. Yeah, yeah, you know, this seems so daunting. First of all, thank you for making me stick to this because this, it was <laughs> here, hard. here. This is the and Lee Johnson project. <laughs> it was so daunting to start this, but you know, it's reinvigorated my love for philosophy. Same. Too. I have also I've had to learn so much. It's been amazing. Just it's like my own little like homework project before yeah. every one of these. So it's been really great in that sense. I've learned so many things just preparing for this to talk to you all. Got to be as smart as you all. Oh, stop it. <laughs> well, thank well, you both. It's been awesome. I'm really looking forward to next season. So again, listeners, we're going to be taking a two-week break right after we do the very final Afterthoughts episode for this season, which you can see on our YouTube channel. We're going to take a two-week break, and then we'll be back with a whole new set of weekly episodes, hotel bar sessions. So thanks so much for listening, and we hope to see you again next season. Bye, y'all. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.